Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Automating Open Source Security, a SANS review of WhiteSource, sponsored by WhiteSource. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Serge Borso, SANS Community Instructor and Analyst, and Rami Elron, Senior Director of Product Management at WhiteSource. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to end the webcast over to Serge. Hello everyone, my name is Serge Borso and today we're going to be talking about White Source's solution. Briefly about myself, I'm a SANS community instructor with uh, over a decade of experience in the information or cybersecurity field. I operate an information security consulting company where we focus primarily on providing penetration testing services and security awareness training services. As a consultant working on the Red Team, I have the task of identifying flaws in PCI networks or mobile apps, web applications, and so on, and then producing a coherent report conveying what was found as part of that process. And part of this really revolves around understanding the business I'm working with, their products, their services, their culture, their expectations, and a large portion requires technical expertise to actually be successful and provide value without causing harm during a penetration test. And like most professionals, there is also a desire to continue and get better and innovate. And that's definitely what I'm all about. Doing a job well is one thing, continually improving and honing skills is something else. And in my experience, what can help with this and essentially increasing efficiency is having the right tool for the job. And you don't always know what's out there until you look and learn about it. With that, I'm going to share my experiences over the last couple of months working with White Source's solution. I'll talk about my initial thoughts on the tool, the areas I focused on, and basically what I learned and how to apply this knowledge. For today's agenda, at its core, what I want you to know is that White Source is a security solution. It's a technology that integrates with the SDLC to enable security professionals to help development teams by providing information on the best components for a project and being able to identify and help prioritize vulnerabilities in the code, open source code specifically. So let's talk about how it works and then I'll discuss its features and get into the new technology elements which is called Effective Usage Technology, or Effective Usage Analysis. Finally, I'll hand over the presentation to Rami for additional discussion on their solution. So what I'll be talking about is the background of the problem. What we're really dealing with here in the world of open source security and open source applications is a lot of components, a lot of vulnerabilities, and a lot of people having to spend time trying to figure this out for the organization, delve into remediations, working with other teams, working with the continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, and getting your product to market in a timely fashion that's ultimately gonna be secure to an extent when you release it, it's challenging. The reason why, and it's not just gonna be web applications, of course, but the reason why we have the OWASP top 10 and injection is still number one on that list it's because it's hard to do it. It's hard to write a robust, secure application that's gonna be able to satisfy the needs of all your users and then continually maintain and update that, release new features, squish all the bugs, you know, or re remediate your vulnerabilities in, in a timely fashion. It's challenging to do this. So what White Source tries to do, and I think they do a pretty good job based on my experience using the tool, is help us with the automation, automation of finding these vulnerabilities and open source components, and then kind of bridging the gap between not just the development team working on writing the code, but also the security professionals within your organization to help remediate those flaws and prioritize what's most important for the security of a given application. So kind of how it, how it works here. Um, the white source solution 
can be integrated with package managers, continuous integration servers, and build tools throughout a system of plugins, agents, and services. So integrating white source with my project when I went ahead and actually started you know, doing doing my analysis of this tool. Uh, it was pretty straightforward. I logged into my account via the white source website. I access my API key, and then utilizing the Maven plugin, it basically parsed my POM file and created a, a project for me right within their, their dashboard. The plugin took the guesswork out of the integration process. So it wasn't too, too challenging to set this up. After it's configured, the plugin's job is to utilize the white source API, essentially, to send open source usage information to white source. In turn, I was able to see relevant information in the white source dashboard. Now, from there, white source's technology performed a hash calculation, uh, essentially creates a digital signature for all the components in my project and compare the unique signatures with the signatures in its own database. And this is how I was able to detect the open source components in the project. So to be clear about that, basically it you know, parses out, see what, sees what's, um, what components I have in a given project, and it checks you know, a hash, makes a unique signature based on the different components that it finds, and then basically checks that hash against what it knows about. And if it knows that a given library or a given component of code has a vulnerability, then the tool's obviously in a pretty good position to say, hey, there's a known vulnerability of this because it's already been publicly identified. So that's essentially how it works. When I run my build, though, White Source automatically populates the dashboard with real-time report um, that I'll show you here in just a moment. This shows all the open source components detected, as well as issues associated with those components. In terms of issues, I'm essentially talking about vulnerabilities. And I do want to touch on false positives briefly. There really shouldn't be any false positives with this component of the tool um, because of the hashing. Um, because the hash calculation, there's a high degree of certainty that what's been identified by the tool is actually the component in question. And the rest of the work is based on publicly available information about the open source components. So the project inventory uh, basically consists of a multitude of libraries that White Source breaks down into their basing components. So we're talking about kind of looking at this screenshot right here, version, a language or type, description, associated products that may contain this component within my, my uh, project or product or project inventory, SHA-1 hash, and additional features here which is what we're looking at, like I said in this slide. It's uh, the inventory report conveying all the libraries that comprise a given project. So it's a quick little view of kind of what we've included in our, our project. When the white source solution determines that one component has a vulnerability, it is this inventory detection mechanism that helps to easily identify other portions of our code or product base affected by the flaw. So this quick detection and identification provides security personnel with the means to ascertain the breadth of a given vulnerable component. So if I want to know where else a vulnerable component is being used at in my, you know, across my organization, I can simply run this report uh, once my project is integrated. So vulnerability detection and remediation. So this technology detects code with vulnerabilities and provides remediation information utilizing its database of known vulnerable components. We can see the results of this feature in the primary dashboard of the homepage, which we've already looked at here. What we can also leverage, or actually we'll see that here in a second, but we can also leverage these vulnerabilities to serve as kind of a filtering option to create reports and provide the basic or basis for criteria to build policies using a policy feature, which I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. This feature, this vulnerability detection feature, is important because it automates the discovery of problematic software components and can reduce the time it takes for security folks to become aware of the situation. Ultimately, I see this as potentially you know, increasing efficiency, really. The faster I can be made aware of a flaw in my product base, the quicker I get out of that, that situation and deal with it. So what we're looking at, the bottom part of this slide right here, is a detailed drill down into a specific vulnerability that was identified in my test project. The link to the CVE details is there as well, which is useful because if I need to get a more detailed read kind of on the actual CVE and the details of that vulnerability to remediate it, I just have it right there with a quick link. Once I got this far with using the tool, I had a, a pretty good understanding of what was kind of happening in the background. Uh, what I mean by that is at this point I've integrated it, I have a test product and a test project in there. 
the tool has you know parsed out um, all of the components I'm using for hash, hash calculations. I have to do just log into the dashboard and check it out to see what it's found in terms of vulnerable components. And it's so real time, real time, you know, when I run a build as to if I have some issues with the code, I get to see that immediately. And White Source also provides suggested remediation steps, which I would expect, you know, any mature tool that identifies security vulnerabilities also typically will tell you how to go about fixing it. That's nice though, it's built in. The suggested fixes typically involve updating affected software when possible. There's other methods to deal with vulnerabilities. So you can replace the affected code or change the components. Uh, but it's all kind of built right into the tool for us. So it's, it takes some of the guesswork out of that. License compliance, what we're looking at here is a nice graph of the distribution of licenses within a given project that I've integrated into White Source. So depending on your situation, you may have license restrictions, which could dictate the types of licensing that are appropriate for your components or your project or your business or your applications really. Conversely, a common situation when dealing with open source software is a lack of any license being associated with a given library. So you'll be able to see what, if any, licenses in, in our code um, is associated or what licenses are associated with the code base after we run an integration plugin and import the project. The white source solution detects the open source libraries in the project and subsequently assigns an open source license associated with that. So in-house or commercial components will appear as unknown or otherwise an unspecified license, which is what we're looking at here. You can kind of see at the top, we got the GPL. A lot of this is going to be Apache 2.0. There's also, you know, some requires review at the bottom and a, a gray unspecified license. That's what those are referring to. For our own proprietary libraries, we can mark those as in-house by setting a rule uh, based on a library name or some other unique indicator uh, within the dashboard. Default behavior is uh, the, white, the white source solutions identify all the open source licenses, and you can easily see that displayed here when you're not committing compliance as well. Policy enforcement, I just briefly touched on this uh, just a moment ago, but uh, the tool also has a policy component. So what we can do with this is we can create a policy based on attributes such as license type or vulnerability severity. So for example, we could set up a policy to like fail a build if components have a high CBSS score. Not that most folks would ever do something like that, but the policy component does lend itself to the situation and the capability. Also, in this slide, you can see that the tracker type option, we have integration with JIRA and work items as well, which can be convenient depending on if your business is having to, to use those. Really, the, the point of this policy is to reduce the number of new components we have to manually review. So if we are only comfortable with using components based on certain license or vulnerability severity, we can leverage this feature to automate the process of allowing components to be used. It's really the, the sweet spot for this. There's also a browser plugin, just an FYI on this, a selection tool that the white source provides. It's for Chrome right now, Chrome only, as far as I'm aware. So as developers browse like a Maven repository website, for example, the plugin tries to identify the, the components that we're looking at. And right within our browser, it'll, it'll break it down and say, this is acceptable to use or not based on the policy that we have in, created within the, the web um, the website or the web application dashboard. So what I mean by whether it's acceptable to use or not, it's based on like how well is it maintained, the quality, you know, the quality is it maintained well, is it contribute to, as well as the license type, like is this license um, okay with us and our business, and the risk. So if we have too many vulnerabilities with a given component, right within our browser, as we're looking for that component, we can easily see that this is not going to be acceptable to use in our given situation. Next thing I want to talk about here is alerting. And what we're looking at here is the top alerts. This is the dashboard view. So white source will alert us when like a new version of a library is made public, good to know, or when bugs are identified or a component has maybe multiple licenses associated with it. As with the other white source dashboards, the alerts overview does a great job of indicating the key elements of what caused the alerts and it provides the options to once again drill down into the details. Or we can also choose to ignore the alerts. There may be many times when we're well aware of the situation, we don't really care about it at this point in time, and we may need to go back and look at it at a future point in time. So we can ignore it, kind of declutter our interface, but still 
have that information available to us to reference back to. So what I mean by that is once you ignore some of these selected alerts right here, there's, of course, a way to go back and just check out the ones you previously ignored, for example. Uh, with that, what we also want to look at here and understand is that we can see the occurrences and the creation date and description and the type. We have, we have all the clickable information, if you will, to really delve into why this is other alerts, where is this component being used at, how many times is it occurring, so on and so forth. So it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's useful from that perspective. And the alerting it comes in the form of security alerts, like uh, when a vulnerability is identified with the component we're using, or quality alerts, like when bugs in a component are detected, and policy alerts, as we discussed a moment before. But we also get alerts when a new version of components uh, is made available as well. So reporting, nice graph right here, or a nice, nice page. Um, it's pretty, pretty clearly laid out. I kind of like how that's done, personally. This uh, the reporting output, that's what we're looking at right here, the reporting output. We can generate reports using a dashboard, and we have a bit over a dozen options for reports. I'm just going to focus on, on one right now, and what that is, um, the risk report, which is what we're looking at right here. It shows the overall risk score per organization or per product. So I use this to quantify the security of a given application or business unit and track code quality and how code quality and developer emphasis on security has improved security posture over time. What I mean by that is metrics, okay? We have to have some feature or some type of metrics to track and assist a business in understanding and evaluating its risk posture and determining where additional resources may be required to get a grip on you know, a project that may have an inordinate amount of high vulnerabilities, for example. And this report helps me delve into that, and I can you know, obviously share this with decision makers or with the business or with folks on the development team, as the case may be. So what I like about this is it's kind of like just one spot. You go to this, you check to see what the risk is with this application or with this code base or the component, wherever the case may be, in this case, the product. And you can just get kind of a nice sense of you know, what the attack service may be. And then below that, the last part of this slide right here, you can see the, the security, the vulnerability, the library, and once again, all the, the drill down options into exactly what you want to focus in on for remediation efforts. The the big thing here that's changed with white source for those of you who may be familiar with it, maybe more familiar with it than I am, is something called effective usage technology. And a big piece of this is going to be kind of the shift from first gen to second gen to this this new this new technology. And I'll just I'm going to briefly cover this before I let uh, Rami take over and um, share his, his knowledge. But a big piece of this product review was actually to get in front of the new technology, effective usage analysis. To understand this latest technology, I'm just, like I said, briefly talk about the original software composition analysis. What happened there was back in the day, uh, ooh, over a decade ago, uh, what we had for software composition analysis was essentially we tried to match code snippets to find references to open source components uh, for a, an application. And then based on that, we might alert of, you know, if there's some vulnerabilities. It was slow, it wasn't really accurate, it's a lot of false positives, trying to match on a code snippet wasn't ideal. Second generation software composition analysis came into the picture about seven years ago or so and featured a lot of significant improvements, uh, real-time feedback, full SDLC integration, fast scanning, accurate results in the context, context of like matching on an open source package being used, like per the, the hashing that we see now. Uh, there's a caveat, though. When we use an open source component, this second generation technology assumes we've used the entire referenced open source code base or package. This method of identifying reference code can produce a whole list of vulnerabilities associated with the component, even when our code is not technically affected by it. So just like first gen SCA solutions were prone to, fall, or, yeah, prone to false positives, the second generation solution is also not able to effectively or granularly identify which components are being executed. So while the second gen solution does a great job of identifying open source components, it doesn't, really, doesn't like typically have the capacity or insights into where or how a given component is being used and to what extent. So with that, white sources technology kind of tried to shift this, okay, and generate some new technology to understand the way a user consumes 
open source components within an application, then map that back to the usage or the actual vulnerabilities identified with what's being used in the code base. So what has this happens, you know, basically the technology identifies all the vulnerable functions, functionalities, and then provides insights about whether the application is actually making the calls to the impacted code. So you have a library, you know, you have an application, the library, or some component you're using, there's known vulnerabilities to that library, but is your code actually using the vulnerable function? That is what this is getting to the bottom of. This makes the vulnerability an effective vulnerability if you're actually using that vulnerable component and leveraging the vulnerable you know, function of that, of that code base. So it's pretty interesting. Security teams are able to provide the required evidence and we can address these you know, in real time or much quicker and, or ignore it if we don't have a, a true, true finding. So the goal is no longer to match 100% on a given reference to a package, but rather identify which functions in a given library are actually being used by an application. Hence, effective usage analysis. And that was really what I was going for with this, this first gen, second gen, and third gen. So I'll skip over here to this vulnerability uh, impact analysis. And what we're going here, uh, talking about here basically, and I'll, I'll try to make this brief um, so I can pass over to Rami, like I said. So up until now, basically our, our conversation is concerned. Um, nothing in the white source solution so far has conducted any, any code scanning at this point until we're talking about this, this new technology. There's a hashing function we talked about before, but that wasn't really a code scan. With effective use of technology component, there is a code scanning feature being incorporated. And we can enable this feature of effective uses technology via uh, like a file system agent configuration file. So in order for the effective usage analysis technology to understand what components of code are actually being used, it has to scan the code base, which, you know, if the wheels in your head are turning, it, it kind of is logical. I can't determine what components you're using without scanning to see what components you actually have. So performing this analysis can be a little bit slow, but the way that this is a little more efficient than other solutions I've seen is, uh, or, you know, other attempts at this. Um, effective use of technology overcomes, you know, kind of slowness by leveraging the base technology we've already have originally with, with this solution to perform a more robust scan on previously identified vulnerable components. So we don't scan everything necessarily. It's just more of a, what's already been identified as vulnerable. Then from there, we can delve in and just uh, scan that code. So once we configure it to the effective usage analysis outputs prominent, we can see it right here in the screenshot. The green that we're looking at means there's no effective references to vulnerable code. The yellow means some vulnerabilities in reference code are identified, and the red means effective references from code can be mapped back to the identified vulnerable vulnerabilities reported for a component. And gray, uh, white source identified that the latest analysis, the library may be outdated. So we got a few different boxes or shields here that we can check out. So when we look at this effective futures analysis output from various perspectives, we can check it out from our organization or a product or a project as like the appropriate dashboard to view. Most of the time, uh, I think teams will view the output on a product level to address the effective vulnerabilities based on a product's criticality. Um, what I want you to also know here is that this effective usage analysis can clearly depict where references to vulnerable code reside in a given library. And to be clear, if there's no vulnerability, then there's no attack surface, which means there is not a known path to application exploitation, at least at this level. The last thing I want to talk about here is the trace analysis components, which is also part of the effective usage technology. The trace analysis associated with the red shield provides us with a quick path to discovering the affected components. So it's kind of like another drill down where we found that top left here in the screenshot, you'll see you got the red shield up there. From there, we'll drill down to the bottom right where we actually see a trace view of exactly what we want to focus in on for remediation efforts or for at least additional information about the details of the vulnerability and where it resides within our code. So logging is kind of an essential part of the debugging and this trace view to basically depicts the output of the effective usage technology provides a log or reference point to what components affected down to the line of reference code. So this granular information also includes, you know, dependency paths, the research in order to address the vulnerability. And ultimately this is gonna, you know, guide us to issues while providing some more pertinent information. So security folks alike now have the detailed information to delve into the finding and gain a deeper understanding of the root of the vulnerability. And as it's, it may exist in other components or other parts of the business as well. All right, I think I've taken up enough time already. I'm gonna go ahead and think about passing this over to Rami. 
Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me start by saying that for years, software developers have been facing an increasing challenge to deal with uh, what seems to be an ever-growing number of reported security vulnerabilities. Indeed, the sheer number of security vulnerabilities could possibly compel some to question their ability to address reported vulnerabilities in a manner that is effective, let alone efficient. The purpose of my presentation is to expand on some of the hallmark facets concerning effective usage analysis. So without further ado, let's dive into the first slide. As the slide notes, only some of the reported security vulnerabilities in open source libraries are referenced by the developer's code. Why, why is such a notion important? Let me explain. In an attempt to combat security vulnerabilities and doing so without compromising on agility, organizations have arguably been considering approaches to prioritize vulnerability handling. They were contemplating uh, which ones constitute a real risk and which ones should be addressed first. That said, in lack of any means to detect how their projects are impacted by reported vulnerabilities, Organizations, and, and perhaps to be more precise say here, development and security teams in particular, have been struggling to establish the appropriate attention and perhaps I would say prioritization that was warranted for reported vulnerabilities. And some might also add that attaining such a goal has proven to be a daunting task. That said, it does not necessarily have to be that way. And in order to assess why, let's move to the next slide. As the uh, slide uh, build-up progresses, uh, I would like to briefly address the important, uh, even critical aspect of prioritization. Prioritization can become a truly viable proposition once a, one can establish w which reported open source security vulnerabilities are actually effective and which ones are non-effective. Now, a reported security vulnerability a, in an open source component is deemed effective if its code is referenced either directly or indirectly by the software's, well, by the software's project proprietary code. Since effective vulnerabilities are found to be referenced from proprietary code, they, that, that would mean that they could become prime candidates for prioritization. And perhaps alternatively put, an ability to detect effective vulnerabilities should enable organizations to eff not, not just effectively, but perhaps efficiently even prioritize remediation efforts. I would even add to that that the higher the ratio between effective and non-effective vulnerabilities is, the higher the potential realized value is likely to be. Uh, as a white source uh, research revealed, the commonly observed ratio in software projects between a non-effective, which on this slide are colored in green, and effective vulnerabilities that are colored in red, a, that observed ratio is a pretty high. In fact, the ratio that is commonly evidenced in early a, deployment cases that we uh, encountered was even more pronounced than the 7 to 30 ratio that is displayed on the slide. A, we have uh, been evidencing 80 to 20, even 90 to 10 ratios. And again, these are no theoretical figures. Most importantly though, these results, I believe, convey a sense of the value potential that underlies an ability to accurately detect vulnerabilities that are effective. And they would even suggest that such an ability could enable the development and security teams to prioritize efficiently prioritize the handling of vulnerabilities and the remediation efforts that are associated with such a process. This is essentially the uh, raison d'etre, so to say, underpinning effective usage analysis. So let's please move to the next slide to uh, uh, discover more. I think that at this point, it uh, becomes quite uh, natural to ask, so what is effective usage analysis? It, it's a technology. It combines highly advanced technology with a powerful, which is also very friendly, a user interface, a UI, user experience, whatever you, you prefer to call it, 
And it does so to produce, um, a, to produce an experience overall that enables development and security teams to efficiently deal with the security vulnerabilities and importantly, while preserving agility. Not doing so while preserving agility would probably miss some of the key objectives associated with uh, such a requirement in the first place. But effective usage analysis was really designed with uh, advanced algorithms that result in highly accurate results and, as was uh, also mentioned earlier, a low likelihood of false positives. The technology supports, uh, in addition, a swift analysis processing. And I would like to expand on that. It, ex it actually scales to support projects with hundreds and more of libraries. A, it typically completes analysis within mere minutes, frankly. And furthermore, uh, the technology was designed to accommodate advanced language use cases. Uh, there are many examples I could uh, perhaps uh, share, but uh, let me perhaps uh, delay that if we have enough time at the end. Analysis results, importantly, this is an important point, analysis results are processed in a way uh, so that there is an attempt to classify the vulnerabilities using what uh, is officially called indicators or effectiveness indicators, and we perhaps more tentatively call them shields. These shields denote the analyzed effectiveness, and the UI implementation features a variety of such indicators uh, and adds to that charts and reports that support the uh, assessment by users. It's actually pretty quick, such assessment. Now, when you look at the screen, you will see that the uh, upper part, it's an excerpt that uh, depicts two alerts that are marked with a green shield. And uh, this denotes no found call traces leading from proprietary code to pertinent library vulnerabilities. The excerpt additionally depicts a, an alert that is marked with a red shield, and that denotes the discovery um, a, of a pertinent effective vulnerability. There is also a, a, an excerpt at the bottom of this slide, and this one portrays a trace that leads from the proprietary code, which is called the origin, to the target, or what we typically call the culprit for this use case, uh, which is the vulnerable open source code. In, uh, uh, to sum this, I would say that effective usage analysis offers a truly powerful value proposition. And in order to fully understand how that comes into play, uh, perhaps we should move to the next slide to uh, re reveal some of the key highlights. So, the slide in front of you uh, depicts what uh, we consider to be the salient aspects of effective usage analysis uh, value and its value proposition. Uh, let me run by them. Uh, perhaps uh, I will pick on some of them in uh, more uh, detail. First, I think that uh, we can tell that it enables considerable potential savings. That is uh, due to uh, several reasons. But uh, first and foremost, thanks to minimized attention by developers towards non-prioritized vulnerabilities and what culminates in higher work efficiency potential. Additionally, effective usage analysis produces highly accurate results. This could truly help organizations realize an accurate risk assessment, which is important because it's not just about assessing the risk, it's about getting as accurate as possible to determine what needs to be done. These are all actionable insights. And talking about the uh, actionable insights, I think that uh, another key item is the ability to facilitate uh, such insights that concern vulnerabilities rather than merely capturing the vulnerability detail or minutiae, if you will. And this in turn promotes better remediation potential. Finally, I think that one could also argue that effective usage analysis fosters effective collaboration among different organizational teams. A, primarily development and security. How is this done? Well, there are many a, ways to a, answer that, but I think that key, a, the key approach here is by providing an objective metric, not just a subjective one, but a truly objective metric for prioritization. That a, by highlighting effective vulnerabilities a, that are warranting greater attention, it is possible to enable a win-win situation for both teams, security and development alike. In order to present the benefits that are associated with this feature, I would like to ask to move to our next slide.
So uh, there are, there's actually a raft of helpful uh, functions and capabilities that are, are incorporated in the uh, implementation of effective usage analysis. In the next few slides, I'm going to highlight six of the most salient aspects. Let's please move to the uh, first facet. So the first facet deals with the ability to receive in-depth information on security vulnerabilities. Effective usage analysis offers truly comprehensive vulnerability data. And this allows users to discover not just direct, but indirect references as well from proprietary code to vulnerable open source code. The a screen expert, a, a excerpt that you see in front of you a, displays a, the number of found references for a vulnerabilities that are associated with a lot, with a with such an alert, a a reference indicates a found path. A, let me perhaps a, a, I'll, I would like to actually expand a bit on this. A reference a, a offers a way to a, a understand what a, was a, what path are what paths are found from the proprietary code to a vulnerability. A trace denotes a series of a, one or more calls that lead from proprietary code to a vulnerable open source component. And the vulnerability can have, in any given project, zero or more references. Uh, each of those references may feature one or more traces. Uh, this is actually pretty straightforward because the application of this is very consistent. And the ability to receive such information truly helps uh, users establish what lies behind security vulnerabilities so that priority a prioritization could actually take place? Let's please move on to the next slide. So here we see the ability to verify if a reported vulnerability constitutes a real risk. Effective usage analysis does not merely provide details on found traces. It additionally examines analysis results a, to, a, well, to subsequently classify alerts as being either effective or non-effective, as warranted. The display a, that you see in front of you, the excerpt, shows a green shield that is used to denote no found traces for a given alert. The text that is featured details a vulnerability-related data, and I will actually provide a bit more detail on that as we move a, to, a, 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 to a, a, one of the subsequent slides, but suffice to say here, that the pertinent library alert here has six reported security vulnerabilities that are of severity medium, yet zero of them, and this is captured in the in the parenthesis, are effective. Since zero reported vulnerabilities were found to be effective, the green shield was employed here to mark the library alert. Let's now move to the next slide. Another benefit is an ability to identify the location of calls that are made from proprietary code to the vulnerable open source code. Effective usage analysis in that way adds to the display detail information that you can see here and circled and clearly pointing at the, the uh, well, I, I would consider that to clearly point at the value that underlies such uh, such detail. We can see here the uh, uh, the class, and we can see here the line number concerning the actual call that is made. And this enables users to understand not just what are the vulnerabilities associated with this trace, but also where they are referenced from proprietary code. Let's please move to the next slide. The following benefit concerns an ability to visualize open source usage through a depiction of call traces. Now, this is a term that you will, in a moment, get to see in a, in a much in its glory, so to say. Effective usage analysis is believed to truly help users not just get information, but visualize the way that open source components are being referenced. And this is done by displaying a full call trace. Mind you, not just a partial trace, but a full call trace. The featured excerpt that you see in front of you shows an example of a three element trace that leads from something that is called the application, and this is noted at the bottom of this, uh, of this trace, to the open source extension. 
And this display allows developers to examine the full call trace from proprietary code to the open source component. Now, I'm pretty tempted to e expand on this and elaborate, but I will only say that uh, there could be any number of traces. It does not, it is not limited by any means to a single trace. You could have a hundred or more if uh, so is uh, relevant to the uh, results of, uh, uh, to the analysis results. And you will be able to scroll through them uh, just moving one by one and being able to uh, to uh, 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 to evidence each of the traces and see how each of these options actually presents how calls can be made for uh, vulnerabilities that are detected to be uh, marked with a red shield or in other words a uh, effective and to show how the calls are made uh, from the proprietary code to the vulnerable open source code now let's please move to the next slide just before we actually complete this uh, very short review of, uh, of benefits of the effective usage analysis, one aspect that uh, is interesting to note is not necessarily technical as uh, the previous items or previous essay, uh, aspects were. In this case, I'm referring to uh, the ability to support decision makers through graphics, through charts, and through an abundance of reports. Uh, the featured excerpt in front of you, uh, this is an example for something that can allow users to compare between the reported vulnerabilities and effective vulnerabilities so that they could assess the relative percentage of different finding types. And again, you will be able to see that soon uh, within the context of a given screen. So let's move to the last item on a, our a six item listing here. And this, even though last, it definitely is not least, it's an ability to use and uh, leverage a dedicated API for a programmatic access. A, an ability to extract the complete analysis result set using programmatic means is a godsend to many organizations because a, regardless of the value or, the, a, or, or how attractive the UI is, many would actually ask for an ability to extract information and pass that to external tools that could be used both for automation and for any further analysis that is warranted. So this is indeed a key aspect of the support provided for effective usage analysis that enables both integration as well as uh, promotes uh, automation. So at this point, I think that we are ready to, to, to review how all of these presented aspects come into play as part of the system's UI. So let's move to the next slide to examine that in greater detail. So this slide, truly, uh, this, this slide really highlights two main areas that uh, feature effective usage analysis related content and they are uh, highlighted uh, uh, as well. Area number one, features shield and summary vulnerability detail for the listed library alerts. I would like to ask you to note that the list represents a subset of the alerts. There are more alerts as well, a, and also a dedicated listing of security only alerts that can be viewed by selecting something that you can see in front of you. Uh, it's a security option button on the right side of the top alert table header. Now, as you can see the description, I'm looking at uh, the area, uh, area number one. So the column that is highlighted there, the description, provides a graphical and a textual level of detail on each alert using a shield on one hand to denote effectiveness and providing additional textual information to expand on, uh, such, an indica uh, on such an indicator. We've already got acquainted with the red and green shields. The yellow shield denotes cases where typically effectiveness or non-effectiveness could not be fully established based on known vulnerability data. And as noted previously, there is also, I believe it was noted previously, there is also a gray shield that denotes a case where pertinent analysis results are possibly outdated. And that could be following changes to the library, for instance, a new vulnerability that was introduced, that was discovered and captured in the database. And it is recommended to run again analysis for projects that are marked with such a shield. 
Uh, finally, let me add that there is also a one last option, a no shield a, or a blank shield, if you will, and it denotes cases where no analysis was uh, run. So uh, the particular element that does not have a shield was not subject to such analysis. Um, area number two features some graphs that portray important effective usage analysis statistics. If I were to start with the donut chart, it denotes the analysis coverage in the particular area of context. And I think that this is an important notion. Right now we are looking at a screen, but it is important to accentuate the fact that you have information pertaining to a given context. Right now we're looking at a product level, but there is also a project level. There are multiple, there are potentially multiple projects beneath a given product and there could be multiple products under a given organization. So depending on the level you're at, depending on the context that you're looking at, you will see the depiction both on the left-hand part that is marked uh, under area number one and area number two as well. All of this information matches the context and this is, this is incredibly important because it allows anyone to not just tell on a given context what are the presented results, but to compare different, uh, uh, different uh, displays that uh, concern the implementation and the usage of different components under different products or different projects. This is a, this is a very important aspect of the UI and uh, actually represents and highlights some of its power. Now, in order to uh, perhaps uh, expand on that, uh, you can see that the analysis coverage shows a, a percentage. It could be anything between zero to 100, unsurprisingly. And when it, uh, when it uh, is a 100, that would simply mean that all uh, of the elements that could be potentially subject to analysis are indeed so. There could be, of course, a case where you have yet to subject uh, some of the projects to uh, effective usage analysis, and you have maybe uh, only be able thus far to uh, do so for 50% of uh, your environment. So as a result, the effective score that you will be able to uh, see will not reflect the potential value, but the actual examination that was run by analysis, and that is also significant. That actually allows us to move upwards to see what was noted, what is noted here as an overall score. And that overall score presents a number out of 10. To make it downright simple, I'll tell you this. If you haven't yet run any analysis whatsoever, and that goes for any environment where, a, a, where effective usage analysis is also non-applicable, you will get here a 10 out of 10. Basically, the score here corresponds with the reported vulnerability. So you could treat that as something of a percentage. However, if you are able to run analysis and you happen to find out that some of the results indicate green shields, those green shields in a relative sense will be removed from the 10 and then you will get a number out of 10 that represents your posture for all of your environment, regardless of whether or not it supports a, a effective usage analysis or not. And this is because you may have a variety of projects, some of which are supported at the moment, and some are, are, are which are slated for support uh, anytime soon. But this, the, and the significance of this is that it enables you to get a view of your effective posture, regardless of the level of support that you right now have. That said, it is, after all, important to understand within the scope of analysis coverage, what is the relative percentages, uh, uh, the relative percentage of each of the findings, whether it is effective or not. And for that purpose, you have the uh, final graphic here, which is on the left part under area number two. So here you may ask, why is that the analysis index is 3.3 or 3.3, and it looks the same for overall effective score. And this is pretty straightforward. This is because the analysis coverage is 100%. If it were not 100%, then you would see some discrepancy here. I am. A, a, I must. I must tell you that what actually strikes us as a, as a highly a highly interesting was the fact that all of these details proved to be immensely helpful for customers when they ran 
their analysis based on the findings that effective usage analysis provided because all of them really complemented each other. And once you get a bit used to the way that these graphics correspond with the findings, it becomes really second nature. Now, just to, co just to uh, complete the review on this particular uh, screen, look back under area, area number one, and you will see that next to the shields, next to the colorful shields, there is also a textual description. If we pick, for instance, the item that is third from the bottom, and the, the reason I'm highlighting that option is because we are going to expand its view in the next uh, slide, but before we do so, a Jackson data bind. If you're looking at this item, you will notice that it has a red shield. And next to that, you will see a textual description uh, that notes high, uh, and then a number five, and, a number, uh, and another number one within parentheses. The explanation for this, which was briefly noted or referenced earlier, is that for this particular library, there, is a, there were found five reported vulnerabilities of severity high, out of which one was found by effective usage analysis to, have an, to be effective. And in order to get a better glimpse at what lies underneath, let's please move to the next slide. So those who are familiar with a wide source would immediately tell that what we have here is, a, is an expansion of the original view that used to, be a, used to be provided when you clicked on details for any vulnerabilities. And this, is, uh, this helps streamline the, uh, the, the, the process of moving into effective usage analysis usage and the ability to leverage this as best as possible. I will not bore you with all the details here, even though I must confess most found them to be truly helpful in the sense of uh, streamlining the process of determining what is the prioritization. But let me just highlight some of the uh, quick tidbits that will help you better understand what we are looking at. So uh, this view really complements the dashboard view that we previously saw uh, with a detailed listing of analysis findings for each vulnerability. We see a hierarchical view. Area one features the shield. Uh, the, the shield uh, detail. And note that there is a one-to-one -one relationship here between a vulnerability and the shield. This is in contrast with the earlier view. When we examined the project level or a product level, uh, the shield was calculated based on an aggregated and prioritized weighting. Because you might ask, if I have multiple, uh, multiple vulnerabilities under a given library, and let's say that one is red and the other one is green, uh, what would be the uh, what would be the result the the resulting uh, shield for such a library? So we have also incorporated a prioritization level, a prioritization scheme based on which you could tell that there are different strengths here, and it's very straightforward and truly uh, logical in a sense. Red is stronger than yellow. Yellow is stronger than green. As long as you keep in mind this pretty simple uh, logic, you are able to tell what is the likely result of any aggregation that will be done on a higher level than the one you're looking at right now. But right now, it's a very straightforward depiction because there is a one-to-one -one relationship. So it's very simple. If you have found a path leading from proprietary code to vulnerable code, it will be red. And if you are looking at something where no such traces were found, it will be green. So given the fact that I noted earlier, this is a hierarchical view, you can probably already tell that by clicking on an element at the top of uh, this screen, you will be able to uh, present different details at the bottom part. And in this particular case, we have uh, clicked on the third item from the top. We have here a red shielded item. And for that red shielded item, you can see at the bottom that there was one found reference to vulnerable entities. That could, there could be many of them. This uh, example is a pretty simple one, but there could be multiple uh, results provided for that uh, finding. However, in this particular case, you can see immediately what is the reference entity ID, which is highlighted in red. And when you would click on such an item, on the right-hand side, in this particular case, since it's only a single finding, it was selected by default. But if you have multiple, you will click on the one uh, that you uh, prefer. And then on the right-hand side, you will see a full listing of caller traces. In this case, we have two. And you can see that you move from one trace to the, one, uh, to the next one by scrolling. 
So you could simply look into that and figure out what is the path leading from the application to the uh, open source vulnerable code. Now we have added, as you can tell, we have added means to quickly identify which row you are looking at. And in addition to that, uh, you can see the, as was noted earlier, the class name and the line number, which is a boon for developers who are looking to find out where the call was made in order to either consider any changes to the code or even consider other approaches to remediate this situation. This is really becoming much more interesting as you dive into the information. Now, just as a very quick comment, a, the area that is highlighted as number four provides what we call a filter strip. And that goes to show you a, how, we, a, how we looked into the UI experience. Normally, it would be expected that customers would not just focus on the a, incident where there is a single jar that you want to examine its vulnerability findings. And some might say, I would like to see the same jar, but I would like to examine it in a different context. So normally, it would not be, a, a, it would not be extremely peculiar to expect customers to step out of this screen and select a different context. We found out that this is a pretty straightforward process in terms of the workflow, and as a result, we incorporated the filter strip, which allows users to simply select the context, the product and the project, and immediately, regardless of where they came from, see how the details change to uh, reflect the new context. This, is also a, this was also a, a proven benefit for many customers that looked into the results and, figure, and, and, and were interested in figuring out how they relate to others. So this is basically what I had a, planned here. This concludes my part. A, thank you very much, and I'll return now to a search. Hey, thanks a lot, Rami. That was awesome. We're down to the last four minutes, I think. So maybe a good time to open up the discussion to the audience for questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both for that great presentation. I'll just jump in and get started. Our first question is, what does white source find for vulnerable libraries compared to OWASP depending checker? Rami, did, uh, did you want to take that one? I, I'm sorry, I could not hear that. It says, what does white source find for vulnerable libraries compared to OWASP dependency checker? I think the question is regarding the maybe identification of vulnerabilities in the white source solution versus the uh, OWASP dependency checker solution, kind of what the compare contrast is, maybe the value and what white source is doing, what it's going to find versus what OWASP's tool will find. I can't speak to that uh, personally. Is, is, does the question concern the nature of the findings with effective usage analysis? Because I, I would say that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the special aspects of the process that uh, white source is running enables not only to uh, match the, uh, match the uh, elements that are found in the customer's uh, premise uh, based on their identifiers, but allows us with analysis to figure out exactly whether or not a customer code is actually touching upon vulnerabilities. I think that that serves as, a, as, a, as one of the key merits behind our particular implementation. Because uh, for the most part, one could argue that uh, SCA tools were focusing on enabling a reduction of uh, false positives by matching a components based on their identifier. And that proved to be very helpful compared to traditional approaches that realized a certain sense of false positives. And that also added to the heft and to the overhead that many environments I would say suffered from and perhaps still suffer from. I think that a key benefit of having effective usage analysis, which is considered a differentiating factor, is an ability to reduce that count. And regardless of the numbers that were presented earlier, our experience so far showed that it is possible to reduce it very quite significantly to the point where 
where, where security and development need to work together, they appear to, uh, to fight much less than they used to in the past because there are now objective measures to direct what type of approach needs to be done in order to prioritize their process. I think that that constitutes, together with other amenities such as policy handling and a comprehensive database, they together serve as a means to highlight the benefit of our particular implementation. I hope that addresses the question. All right, thanks. We'll jump into one last one here before we go. Uh, in scenarios where we have applications that we do not have source code, so source code for, increasingly, increasingly more common across all organizations, can effective usage technology be used for those applications to identify open source vulnerabilities? If not, can any other white source feature be used to review open source components or inventory applications? I'll let uh, Rami handle the second part of that, but I can say if you don't have the source code for it, and if, if it's open source, you should have access or the ability to at least find the source code, I, I would imagine in some cases. If you don't have the code, though, and you can't upload it, I don't think you'd be able to utilize this feature of the tool. But Rami can probably correct me if I'm wrong, or at least add some more information to that. I, I, I would like to ask if you could repeat that second part, because I was unable to uh, hear it, uh, probably. Sure thing. Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to read the whole thing if that's okay. In scenarios where we have applications that we do not have source code for, increasingly more common across all organizations, can effective usage technology be used for those applications to identify open source vulnerabilities? If not, can any other white source feature be used to review open source components or inventory? Well, we are not dependent on effective usage analysis to find out about vulnerabilities. The ability to use effective usage analysis helps to reduce the count of the resulting vulnerabilities to the point where they become a, a much more viable a proposition for prioritization. But by no means is the existence of the source code or the ability to use effective usage analysis the only way to use wide source for such vulnerabilities. It is definitely possible to use it a, a, without delving into such areas where effective usage analysis at that point becomes warranted. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Thank you so much, Serge and Rami, for your great presentation. And to White Source for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.